Hello, let us solve the problem now. We first argue that this function indeed attains its maximum and minimum value on the given domain. That's a good idea to sketch the given domain. We know that the equation x squared plus 3y squared equals 3 describes an ellipse with semi-major axis square root of 3 and semi-minor axis equals 1. Of course, according to the problem, x and y are both non-negative. So the domain is not the whole ellipse, but just a quarter of this ellipse, which lies in the first quadrant. OK, let me set up a coordinate system now. This is the x-axis and that is the y-axis. And this orange curve represents a quarter of an ellipse which intersects the x-axis at square root of 3 and intersects the y-axis at 1. Of course, this curve is a geometrical representation of an abstract subset of the plane. So that curve is actually this abstract set. The set consisting of all ordered pairs x and y in R to the 2, where x is non-negative, y is non-negative, and x squared plus 3y squared equals to 3. We argue that this given set is a bounded subset of R squared in the first place, and it is also a closed subset of R squared. To show that this set is bounded, we need to show that it can be contained in a circle centered at the origin. This is clear. It's enough to choose the radius of the circle any number greater than the square root of 3. For example, this circle. This circle has a radius greater than the square root of 3, and as you see, it is centered at the origin and it contains the whole orange curve. So this is enough to show that this set, this subset, is a bounded subset of r to the 2. To show that this set is closed, we must show that its component, its complement, sorry, uh, I mean the points of the plane that are not on the orange curve, is an open subset of r squared. To do this, we need to show that every point that is not on the orange curve has a neighborhood that does not intersect with the curve. By a neighborhood I mean by a neighborhood of a point I mean a disk centered at that point without the points on the rim of the disk. Okay, so let us see why this is true. For example, let me choose a point which is not on the orange curve, say this point. It is clear that I can imagine this open this open disk. I mean, a circle centered at the origin, including the points within the circle, but excluding the points on the rim. You see that this does not intersect with the curve. So this shows that for this point, I was able to find a neighborhood exactly lying outside the curve. Of course, you have to convince yourself that this is indeed the case for any choice of my point outside the orange curve. But of course, you know that as much as you go closer and closer to the curve, the radius that you are supposed to choose for your disk should be smaller and smaller. But this is always possible. That is important. It is always possible. For example, let me concentrate on a different point here now. I chose this point a little bit closer to the curve. But still, I hope that you agree with me, you can have still that neighborhood that disk which does not intersect uh, the orange curve. Okay, so you have to make this uh, radius a little bit smaller. So what we have so far, we are given a function f of x equals to xy plus y. We know it's a continuous function because it's a polynomial function. Polynomial functions are continuous everywhere, including the given domain. On the other hand, we know that the, the domain is bounded and closed. And then we know, so this is a theorem that f attains its maximum and minimum on this domain. I have a continuous function defined on a bounded domain and a closed domain. So definitely f attains its minimum and maximum. Okay? 
Now, for the second part of the problem, I want to use two different methods. The first method I want to use is the method of parametrization. Okay, so what is this method? I first parametrize the given curve. Because this is an ellipse, there is a standard parametrization for this ellipse. But if you have forgotten that, you can immediately get it from this uh, argument. This is my curve. And what I do, to, I want to standardize it by dividing everything by 3. So then it becomes this. And I want to write the left hand side as the sum of two complete squares. So instead of x squared over 3, I just simply write x over square root of 3 to the power of 2. And then of course plus y squared equals to 1. So the left hand side is the sum of 2 squared and the right hand side is 1. So this definitely uh, gives us that x over square root of 3 is the cosine of an angle and y is the sine of the same angle. Okay? So, but here, because x and y are confined to in the first quadrant, x and y should be positive. So this, uh, I can write x over square root of 3 as cosine of an angle and y, the sine of that angle, but the important thing is that theta should lie somewhere between 0 and pi over 2 because x and y are non-negative. For the x equation, I multiply everything by square root of 3, so that's my parametrization of this orange curve we had before. And now, my function is actually f of x and y equals to xy plus y. I replace x with actually this value, and I replace y with this value in this function that you see, okay? And then what happens? I will reduce this function, which is a function of x and y, to another function g, say, but which is a function of one single variable theta, okay? Okay, so, and we know the recipe for maximizing and minimizing g. So what I did, I reduced the problem of maximizing and minimizing a function of two variables f to the problem of maximizing and minimizing a function g, which is a function of only one variable theta. And the theta is in the open, in the closed interval from 0 to pi over 2. So the recipe is this. I need to calculate the derivative of g and see for which value or values of theta derivative is 0 and see for which value or values of theta the derivative does not exist. And then calculate the value of g for those values that I found for theta. And we also need to calculate the value of g at the endpoints of this interval 0 and pi over 2. I get a bunch of numbers, then I compare them. I get a finite number of numbers, I compare them. The largest value that I have got so far will be the maximum of my function g, which is also the maximum of the function f. And the lowest possible value that I have got uh, for these numbers is the minimum of g, which is also the minimum of f. Okay? But, uh, so I want to start with differentiating g. But you see here that I have a combination of sine and cosine multiplied. So if I want to directly uh, start differentiating this function, here on this part I have to use the product rule. Uh, okay, to make the equations, uh, the calculations a little bit simpler, I prefer to use this formula. We know that cosine theta sine theta is actually 1 over 2 sine 2 theta. So if I replace that formula in this function, then I will get this function. g of theta is square root of 3 over 2 sine 2 theta plus sine theta. So now I differentiate the function. Uh, g prime of theta becomes this. The reason that this 2 is cancelled is because when I differentiate sine 2 theta, I get a cosine 2 theta, but then I need to multiply by the derivative of 2 theta, which gives me an extra 2, and that extra 2 will cancel that one. Okay. Okay. 
And then what I have to do, I have to equate this uh, derivative to zero. When I do that, I need to solve this equation. But for solving this equation, I remind you about a formula for cosine 2 theta. And that formula is this. Okay, so instead of cosine 2 theta, I put this expression and simplify that a little bit. What I get is this equation. Okay, and then as you see, this is a quadratic equation in cosine theta. So I can, for example, use ABC formula to solve that equation. And then what I get is actually this. And that, so, so what you see here, I have used ABC formula to calculate this part. And then I simplify that a little bit. This is what I get. And still, if I continue my simplification, I will get two answers. So the arithmetic is actually indeed very simple. So I will get these two values for cosine theta. Okay, but be careful. This value is negative and it is not acceptable. Because you remember, I actually limited, we limited ourselves for the, uh, to this interval. So cosine is definitely a positive number and it cannot be a negative number. So I get rid of the negative part and only keep the positive part. Okay, then I have to solve this equation and then find theta. If you just want to directly tackle the problem, then you need to write theta is the cosine inverse of 1 over square root of 3. But I want to solve this problem exactly. So I pretend that I know the answer. So what do I mean by that? I would say that, okay, let theta 0 be the unique solution to this equation in the given interval between 0 and pi over 2. Okay? We know that such an, uh, such an answer exists and it is unique because this number is between 0 and 1. So definitely such a number exists and it is unique. Okay, so let us theta node be exactly the unique answer for this equation. Okay, then what happens? Cosine theta node is equal to 1 over square root of 3. But if you go back here and look at your function, you want to calculate the value of the function for this particular theta node that is still you don't know. But you don't know, you don't need to know theta node. You need to know g of theta node. So it means that if I can manage to know what is sine theta node and sine 2 theta node without even knowing theta node, I can calculate g of theta node. Yes, and this is always possible. How? I just write the formula for sine theta node in terms of cosine theta node. Yes, this is possible. And then I haven't put plus minus here because I know that Theta node is in the first quadrant, sine is also positive. Okay, I will take this number here and put them instead of cosine here and then do some simple calculations. So that is what I get. So I get that sine of theta node is square root of 2 over square root of 3. Okay, and then this is my g theta. What I need to do, I need to calculate g of theta node. Okay? So, g of theta node is exactly this expression. So you see, if you compare this, what I have written here with this one, they are exactly the same, unless I have replaced theta with theta node. And then if I use the same formula for sine 2 theta node, at the double angle formula, what you get is this expression. Yes? And then now everything ready. You see, cosine theta node is given, sine theta node is now calculated here, so I plug them this, and this is what I will get. And then after simplification of various minor simplifications, you will actually get this answer. And I usually prefer to rationalize the denominator, so I rescale it by square root of 3, and then this is my answer. So g of theta node is indeed equal to this number. Okay. So now let us summarize everything here on the left-hand side of the page. That is still, I have a little bit of a space left. So let me draw some borders, not to mix things up. Okay, so what we have so far. We have g theta uh, the, to in this function. Yes, do you remember? This is my function g theta. I just moved that here. 
And then we know that uh, I am working in a closed interval. Theta belongs to the closed interval 0 and pi over 2. Moreover, what we got so far, it's easy. You calculate g, the value of g at this end point. You also calculate the value of g at this end point. You get 1, so it is easy. You see, if I replace theta with 0, I get 0. If I replace theta with pi over 2, this becomes sine of pi, which is, one, which is 0, and then sine of pi over 2, which is 1. I also calculated... Uh, that actually g at theta node which is this number and that this number as you see here is exactly this number I calculated here okay so these are the values for this one so now if I ask you what is the maximum for g you definitely tell me this is the maximum because this is the highest number that I got uh, among these three numbers and if I ask you what is the lowest value of G you will tell me that the minimum of G is actually zero so minimum of G is zero and maximum of G is that number of course minimum and maximum of G are the same as mix minimum and maximum of F correspondingly so it means that minimum of F we were looking for is 0 the maximum of F is 2 square root of 3 over 6 and of course in the problem they haven't asked about it but if they ask about which choice for X and Y makes F minimum and makes F maximum this you can also answer yes so the minimum of G occurs when theta node is 0 yes so if I put theta here 0 cosine of 0 is 1 so X becomes the square root of 3 and Y becomes 0 yes and if I ask you what is uh, when the maximum is attained you say the maximum of F is attained when the maximum of G is attained maximum of G is attained when theta node is chosen for theta yes okay so it means that I go here instead of theta that you see here I put theta node I get cosine of theta node but cosine of theta node is 1 over square root of 3 so X becomes 1 and then if I put theta node here it becomes sine of theta node and you see that sine theta node is here so this is something something that you can also answer so this means that minimum of f occurs if x and y are uh, square root of 3 and 0 correspondingly and uh, mini maximum of f occurs if x and y are 1 and square root of 3 over square root of 3 correspondingly. Now I want to solve the problem uh, with a different method. The method of Lagrange multipliers. Let me bring the figure that we had in the beginning to this page as well. So from your studies of this course, you know that uh, the maximum and minimum of the function f restricted to this domain either occurs at the end points, which in this case are this point with coordinates square root of 3 and 0, and this point with coordinates one and 0 and 1. Or at an interior point such as this point with coordinates x and y. According to the Lagrange multipliers theorem, if f attains its maximum or minimum at such a point with coordinates x and y, then there exists a real number lambda such that the point with coordinates x, y and lambda a point in one dimension higher is a critical point of the Lagrange function L of X and Y and lambda which is defined in this way for this particular case so as you see this is the Lagrange function it uh, depends on one variable more which is called the Lagrange multiplier this is your function and this is the constraint so this is always the case you put your function here plus a Lagrange multiplier multiplied by the constraint which is the equation of your domain actually here but you have to be careful when you want to put the equation here you need to move everything to the left hand side 
and then just pick the left hand side of that constraint equation and put it here. To see why this works you have to go and refer to the proof of this theorem in the course book. But I am just describing the method, how to use it. Okay. Uh, therefore, if the maximum or minimum of f are supposed to occur at an interior point, say x and y of the orange curve, x and y should be, respectively, x and y coordinates of the critical point of the Lagrange function which is a function, as you see, of three variables. In other words, if the point x, y, and lambda is a critical point of the Lagrange function, then x and y is a candidate for the maximizer or minimizer of this function. Moreover, these are the only candidates for maximizers or minimizers of f in the interior points of the curve. Okay, so if I want to find the maximizer and minimizer of my function restricted to this orange curve, according to what you learned now, you have some candidates. Two of those candidates are these points, the endpoints, as you see here. But if it is going to occur in the interior point, the coordinate of that point x and y, yes, together uh, with the lambda, so this, uh, so this x and y should be the x and y coordinates of the critical points of the Lagrangian function. So I will find the critical points of the Lagrangian function, and I read the x and y coordinates of those points, these are my candidates of the maximizers of my function within the curve. And then I also calculate the value of my function at these points and calculate the value of my function at these critical points and compare the results. The highest value that I get is the maximum of my function and the minimum value that I get is the minimum of my function. Okay? Okay, so we start uh, finding critical points of the Lagrange function. First of all, I differentiate L with respect to x. This is what I get. I'm assuming that x is the only variable, and y and lambda are supposed to be constants. Then, similarly, I do the same thing for the partial derivative of L with respect to y, and then finally I do that with respect to lambda, and then to find the critical points, I have to put each one of them equal to zero. So I will take the first one equated to zero, I get that equation. Okay, and then the second one to zero, I get a new equation. And then finally the third one equals to zero, I get another equation. Okay, so now I have three equations here. And I have three unknowns. The three unknowns are x, y, and lambda. So I will set up a system of equations and I will try to solve and find the answers to this equation. Okay, so let me just uh, put a border here so that we are not confused. Okay, now what I do, I will take the first equation and find x in terms of, uh, I, I will find the lambda in terms of x and y okay so i will do it here so i that is the equation that i put here and then lambda becomes minus y over 2x so i calculated lambda from this equation so you see that in order to do that i divide it by x this is possible here because i'm certain about that x is not equal to zero how I, how am i certain about that look here if x is 0 from this equation, y also becomes 0. But this cannot happen because if x and y are both equal to 0, the left-hand side of the third equation becomes 0, the right-hand side of it is 3, and it is not possible. So I am really on the safe side to divide by 2x. x is not 0. Okay, then what I do? I go to the second equation now. Okay, 
this is my second equation and then what I do I use the lambda that I found there and put it here and when I do that I will get this equation and for simplicity I multiply everything by x then I will get this equation now what you see I can take this equation and the last equation of this system these are only uh, related to x and y so I can set up a new system of equations so I set up my system of equations and which is very simple to solve it suffices just to add them side by side when I do that these two terms are cancelled these two terms are added so I get 2x squared and the right hand side I have minus x plus 3 then I move minus x plus 3 to the other side and this is finally a very simple quadratic equation I get and when I solve this equation I simply get two answers one of them is 1 and the other one is minus 3 over 2 but you remember we are in the first quadrant so x cannot be negative so I just clean it to get rid of it and x equals to 1 is the only solution that I have okay now x is equal to 1 I can plug it back into the last equation in this system and then I can find my y okay so if I do that 3y squared becomes 2 and then I divide by 3 and take square root sign then I will get two answers again but again the negative answer is not acceptable because we're in the first quadrant so I get rid of the negative okay so what I got is I got only one candidate the point whose x coordinate is 1 and its y coordinate is this number okay and then I have two more candidates one of them is this endpoint and the other one is that endpoint I calculate the value of my function for these three points and the maximum value is the highest value that I get in this way and the minimum value is the lowest one okay I think very simple now if we do that a week and I have calculated and simplified things that the last one I simplified a little bit and then you can see that this is exactly in parallel with the first method so again you see the minimum value of my function is zero and it is it is achieved at this end point here yes and the maximum value of my function is this number and it is achieved at a point whose x coordinate is 1 and its y coordinate is here. Okay, so I think it's also good to see what really we have calculated using some graphical tools and demonstrations. Here I have used Mathematica 13 to generate this. Okay, so let us just describe what is going on here. Uh, here you, you see there is a blue surface here and that is the graph of the function f of x equals to x y plus y but I have just drawn that part which is related to this problem mainly from the origin up to this blue curve this blue curve is exactly that uh, quarter of the ellipse which I represented in my slides with the orange curve yes okay and then what is this black curve this black curve is the intersection between this blue surface and this surface which is the elliptical cylinder coming exactly vertically up from my ellipse here okay so let me show you what we really what we really calculated there so assume that you are walking on this blue curve this elliptical curve uh, and then looking upward directly upward on this uh, orange sheet here and you somehow see the blue surface on top of your head this black line is exactly your side view of the uh, blue surface okay so what we have calculated we have calculated the maximum distance uh, on top of your head when you are actually walking uh, on this blue curve for example if you are exactly here the distance between you and this black line vertical distance is zero so this means the minimum is actually zero in accordance to what we calculated 
If I go a little bit forward and look upward vertically, then you see that I get something like this. So this is the vertical distance above my head when I'm here. If I go a little bit further, this height actually increases. And then you see that this height is increasing, but it does not increase indefinitely. Yes, for example, when I start reaching to this point, it's still increasing. And then probably around this point, sorry for this, I cannot draw it very perfectly fine. I am supposed to draw them completely straight lines vertically up. So here, uh, apparently around this point, I have my maximum, you see, somewhere here. Somewhere here, the vertical distance is maximum. Then again, if I continue my journey along this line, uh, the distance is actually start uh, inclining, declining, yes? But we know that what we have calculated, we have calculated that the minimum distance is zero. It's completely clear from the picture. And we have calculated the maximum distance is uh, two square root of three divided by six. Okay, so this distance. And we also, by the way, were able to calculate the coordinates of that point, x and y coordinates of this point. So that is exactly what we have done in this calculation. I hope that this video was useful for you. Until the next video, be safe and goodbye. Thank you.